This is the almost timely newsletter for the week of January 28th, 2024. Content authenticity statement. 95% of this week's newsletter was generated by me, the human. You'll listen to some AI-generated music and see some AI-generated photography in the opening. There's a link at the top of the newsletter to learn why this kind of disclosure is important and very soon to be legally required. What's on my mind this week? A bit of a spicy one. Copyright must never, ever, ever apply to machine-made works. Today's a slight departure from our usual tactical fare about AI to something a little big picture when it comes to generative AI and analytics, since all that's the, the machine learning space. Now, before we begin, I want to emphasize super big letters and disclaim, I am not a lawyer. I have zero legal training and no legal expertise beyond the ability to use a search engine intelligently. I cannot give legal advice. And you should hire a qualified attorney in your jurisdiction for legal advice specific to your situation. Okay, we got that out of the way. Let's talk about copyright generative AI and making sure artificial intelligence work product is never, ever eligible for copyright. We should unequivocally ensure machine-made content can never be protected under intellectual property laws or else we're just going to destroy the entire creative economy. Okay, that's a big claim, isn't it? Let's unpack why. Today, in most places in the world, the existing law is such that machine-created works cannot hold copyright. If you create a blog post in ChatGPT, the work is automatically in the public domain since copyright only applies to works created by humans in most places on Earth. Famous court cases like Naruto vs. Slater in the USA have established precedent that works created by non-humans, a chimpanzee in that court case, cannot be copyrighted. There are folks who do advocate that machine-made works should be copyrightable. After all, we're all using generative AI fairly frequently to write blog posts and create images and ideate for meetings. And from one perspective, it seems reasonable that if we write a really good prompt and a machine creates a work product from our hard work, from our prompt and efforts, that we should be able to claim and protect that work, right? Maybe it's a derivative work. It's unresolved in court. On the surface... This seems like a reasonable position. In practice, it would be an absolute disaster. That would pretty much wipe out most creative industries for two reasons, legal and economic. Let's tackle the legal reason first. Let's say, as I did for this newsletter, uh, I use generative AI like ChatGPT to write a song like this. Pretty catchy, isn't it? Today, this song that I made with ChatGPT, because I have no musical skills either, um, this song is ineligible for copyright. I could put it up on SoundCloud, I could put it up on YouTube, I could put it in Apple Music. I do all sorts of things with it, but I can't protect it. If you wanted to, you could use it in any production of yours, and I would have no legal recourse because it's public domain, because it's made by a machine. Now, suppose I was able to copyright this. What would happen if you tried to use it? I could send a lawyer your way and say that you have to cease and desist the use of my copyrighted work or pay me a license and royalties to use the work. That's how it works with human-led works today. Back in the early 1990s, Vanilla Ice sampled the bass line from Queen and David Bowie's song, Under Pressure. It had that very catchy bass line. I'm not going to repeat it here because I don't want them suing me to. Um... Vanilla Ice later had to pay a licensing fee of $4 million for the use of that short bass line. It was like 10 notes long, uh, plus royalties and credit to the original work. Whether or not you meant to, if you used part of my machine-generated song, 
you would owe me a licensing fee and possibly royalties because you would infringe on my copyright. Even though it was machine generated, if this is a world in which machines can hold copyright uh, and I use the machine to make that, you would owe me the money. One of the most important things you can do when it comes to any technology, but especially anything that is AI, is to ask, what can go wrong? What could go wrong here? How could someone take this technology and use it in ways that we didn't intend? How could someone use the laws in ways that we didn't intend? Suppose I took my prompt that generated that very nice song, and I wrote a bit of code and started doing this, started making variation after variation after variation, a dozen, two dozen, Suppose I did it a million times, a hundred million times, a billion times. There are only so many ways you can use recognizable chord progressions and melodies and harmonies and still make music that's worth listening to. And now, if I have, with a lot of compute power, a billion variations, I've pretty much covered every reasonably possible song. Right? Again, if you recall, Vanilla Ice had to fork over $4 million for about 10 notes, right? 10 musical notes. If my billion song catalog is now copyrighted, every musician who composes a song from today forward has to check that their composition or parts of it, recognizable parts, again, Vanilla Ice example, is not in my catalog of a billion variations. And if it is, which mathematically it probably will be, they have to pay me. Every musician, every production company, every streaming company, every movie company, they got to check their music against my billion song catalog that is all copyrighted to see if they are violating my copyright. And if they are, they got to pay up. One person, one corporate entity could take advantage of machine generated copyright law to create a library of copyrighted content that then everyone else either has to pay to use or risk a lawsuit. Whoever has the most compute power to build that library first wins, and then everybody else has to pay tribute or use generative AI along with their own technology to find variations that aren't in the catalog. And guess what? They're probably not going to sound very good because the people who made the, the billion song library off of this very specific prompt, I used a, a, a pop chord progression as the prompt, you're never going to make another pop song because this company that has this billion song catalog has all the pop songs. That wipes out the music industry. That wipes out musical creativity because suddenly there is no incentive to create and publish original music for commercial reasons. I guess people will still play music. But the system that allows a creator today to benefit financially from their work would be severely undermined by this application of copyright law. You know you're just going to end up in a copyright lawsuit sooner or later with a company that had better technology than you. So as a musician, what do you do? You stop composing, right? You become a cover band. This applies to the visual arts. Suppose I use generative AI to render a photo, like this lovely photo of uh, the hills of Sonoma, California at sunset. Pretty nice, right? It's, it's, a ni it's a nice photo. It's reasonably accurate. Now, suppose a photographer publishes a substantially similar photo. Could I claim that their photo infringes on mine? It's possible. It certainly would be costly to defend in court. What about a painting? If a machine can render several billion images and each of those images is copyrighted, then similar images created afterwards by other humans could be challenged, right? If you're a painter and you're painting in impressionistic styles, have the machine generate two billion images that are impressionistic on every subject matter. You're going to have a catalog of things that you can enforce copyright on. There is precedent for this sort of behavior, not with AI, with patent trolls. So patent trolls, if you're unfamiliar, and there's a link in the newsletter. These are companies that buy up portfolios of patents, and then they make their money just suing other companies to pay up. It's legalized extortion, basically. They say, hey, we've got this patent. You, you're filing this patent. Either pay us and settle out of court or we'll take you to court. And defending patents in court is really, really expensive. So a lot of companies are like, fine, fine, fine. Here's your, here's your $100,000 fee. And that's how these companies make their money. Imagine how lucrative it will be for patent trolls to start doing the same thing with copyrights, with AI. So this is the first major reason why we as a civilization should not permit machines to hold copyrights. The second reason is economic. 
When a human creates a work and then licenses or sells it, what happens to that money, right? You make a song, you sell it. People give you money. What happens to that money? The money that you receive is put back into the overall ecosystem in the form of purchases. You you go on to spend it on food and uh, rent and clothing and recreational substances, right? Your money is, the money you get is going out to other people. What happens when machines create? If their work is copyrighted, if machines work is copyrighted, meaning can be protected and sold, then companies have a much stronger incentive to use machines rather than people. The work would enjoy the same level of protection, which in turn means that the profit margins on the work will be much, much higher if you use machines. That song that I made, that was an API call to ChatGPT. It, the song weighed in at about 831 tokens. ChatGPT costs three cents per thousand tokens via its API. 20 bucks a month if you use the web interface, right? Some models like Mixtral that can run locally on your computer cost basically the cost of electricity to run your computer. That song that ChatGPT generated, even if it's not very good, less than three cents to make it. Less than three cents. I recently paid an independent musician $500 for a theme song. You can hear it on my, my water show. For that money, I could have gotten 100,000 songs out of ChatGPT. And I, even if 99,000 of them were stinkers, that would still leave me with massive ROI for the 1,000 songs that did not sunk. The musician that I paid, they went on to spend that money in their economy. If I had paid the same money to OpenAI, that would have gone to you know, data center and GPU costs for the most part and certainly would not be distributed as evenly in the economy. Sam Altman might might spend some of the money to charge his EV or something. But the point is, the money spent on tech tends to hyper-concentrate money with a handful of companies rather than the broad economy. Right? It makes a few people really, really rich and a whole bunch of people not. If machine works remain non-copyrightable, there's a strong disincentive for companies like, like Disney, for example, to use machine-made works. Disney wouldn't use AI-generated music because they wouldn't be able to enforce copyright on it, which makes that work less valuable than a human-led work that they can then fully protect. If machine works have suddenly the same copyright status as human-led works, then a corporation like Disney has much greater incentive to replace human creators as quickly as possible with machines because machines can scale their created works to levels that are only limited by compute power. Think about the art example. A tool like Stable Diffusion XL Turbo can generate an image, a, a, you know, a, a, an impressionistic painting or whatever, in 207 milliseconds. That is a fifth of a second, right? That is literally that. How quickly could Disney or Netflix engineer a giant content catalog that is entirely protected by copyright and they could enforce over any human creator. Like, hey, you made an image of a spaceship that is flying through this kind of nebula. Uh, well, we already did that. It's in, you know, it's, it's image 4,206,591. Pay up. This is why it is so important that we lobby our various governments around the world to keep machine-made content without any intellectual property rights. Write your elected representatives, write your government, write your whoever today to let them know your position on copyright and intellectual property rights. They should be solely reserved for humans. Intellectual property rights should solely be reserved for humans. Machine-made works should remain in the public domain so that human-led works are always inherently more valuable. If we allow machine-made works to be copyrighted and protected, we forfeit our own creative futures to the libraries created by a few well-funded companies that have the, the compute power to create every foreseeable variation of commercially viable content there is, and every other creator will have to pay them. That is not a future that I want to live in. Now, as I said at the top, I am not a lawyer. I have no legal background. I mean, technically I had pre-law as well as my undergrad degree. I'm not a lawyer. If you are a lawyer and I'm wrong about the law and how we've discussed how things will work in a world where AI can hold copyright, leave a note in the comments to let me know what the real deal is as an attorney. If you're an attorney, let me know if I got the law wrong. This is my understanding and speculation based on current law and what would happen if machines got copyrights. Whew. All right, what else happened this week? Uh, in case you missed it, um, 
coming in like a few days, Gmail and Yahoo are changing their deliverability requirements to, for, to, for email. So if you have people that you are emailing that use Google Workspace or Gmail or Yahoo or the companies that you know have Yahoo front ends, it will get harder to get your email delivered to those companies unless you follow the deliverability requirements. Um, we did a whole live stream on this called uh, Fixing Up Email Deliverability. Now, we did it specifically for, you, for people who use HubSpot, but it applies broadly. So check the link in the newsletter. We did a step-by-step walkthrough of how you make those changes. Go check that out. Also this week, we talked about uh, generative AI superpower isn't AI, why social media is such a dumpster fire, and some content curation tactics. All right, let's see what else we got going on this week. Good jobs. We have AI analytics solution architect at Capgemini, AI consultant at a confidential place, digital analytics manager at Harnum, director of AI at Trilogy, generative AI data scientist at Saxon AI, Google analytics manager at Harnum, head of data acquisition at Pronovos, modeling and performance reporting lead at Libra Solutions, and senior data scientist of generative AI at Cognizant. So, Lots and lots of interesting uh, jobs popping up. What else we got in the news? Uh, in Europe, Meta will allow users to separate their Facebook and Instagram accounts and, and divide them, which is nice. Hopefully that will spread to other parts of the planet at some point. Uh, we have contributed content tips. 60% of SEO practitioners are worried about the impact of Google search generative experiments. Uh, we also have uh Chatbot tutors, podcast networks, testing AI tools for faster translation, tools to chat with PDFs, handling ransomware attacks. And then I um, <laughs> had a funny conversation with folks on over on threads that someone sent me this video on YouTube about why we see so many YouTubers holding lavalier mics. So a lavalier mic, I don't have one of them, but we'll just pretend this is one, is a little uh, lapel mic like this. And apparently there's a lot of people holding them in their YouTube videos. And there's a long YouTube video about you know, why people do this. I didn't realize that there are actually a bunch of reasons people do this. Um, I would say as someone who did audio and video and, and theater lighting and sound for years, um, that if you're holding a lavalier, you're using it wrong. But uh, a couple of things that people discussed in the comments on threads. One, some lavaliers are so poorly built, you got to hold them close because down here they won't pick up anything because they're really poorly built. Um, two, some people who are uh, neurodivergent or just very anxious like to have something to do with their hands um, so that they hold on to the microphone. And apparently, when this YouTube video talks about it, uh, there are people who uh, like the look because it looks non-corporate, right? You don't have the expensive hardware or no microphone at all. It doesn't have that polished look. It looks more authentic. So it's a it's a um, part of the zeitgeist around uh, today's video culture. I thought it was interesting. The video is worth watching. All right, upcoming events. Uh, it is travel season. It is event season starting up. Uh, Tourism Industry Association of Alberta in Edmonton, uh, followed by the Independent Consortium Booksellers Association in Denver, Social Media Marketing World in San Diego, the Marketing Process AI Series in March. Uh, we have uh, the Society for Marketing Professional Services in April and in May, uh, Australian Food and Grocery Council in May, and the Marketing AI Conference in Cleveland in September. So lots and lots of events coming up. Uh, really excited to be uh, back out on the road. If you're going to be at one of these events, come up and say hi. Uh, you can find me easily. I'm the one wearing the crazy mask. Thanks for tuning in this week and for your attention. I appreciate you being here. I look forward to hearing your feedback from this episode. Take care. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And if you want to know when new videos are available, hit the bell button to be notified as soon as new content is live.